Okay, we're going to get started, everyone. Welcome uh, to this TCIPG uh, seminar on resilient computing systems. I'm Bill Sanders, as uh, I guess most of you know. Um, uh, we're really excited to have Andrew Wright here today. I'll say something about him in just a minute. But um, also wanted to remind everyone that we have our TCIPG Industry and Government Workshop uh, next week. Uh, officially, the, uh, the deadline's over, and we've had an uh, incredible turnout of about 200 people. But if you really want to come, uh, send us an email. We'll see if we can, we can still fit you in. Uh, today, we're having our monthly uh, webinar uh, related to, uh, again, uh, secure uh, and resilient uh, power grid systems. And we're really pleased to have an old friend of TSIP and TSIPG uh, with us. This is Andrew Wright. Andrew Wright is the chief technical officer of a company uh, called N Dimension Solutions. And uh, Andrew has a really long history by, uh, by most terms today in the area of cybersecurity for the power grid. Uh, first working at Cisco in that area for many years and then transitioning to the CTO, CTO role of um, N Dimensions, uh, which works in that space in 2008. Uh, he also is a very early friend of uh, TSIP and TSIPG and has been coming to our events and participating in our events and interacting with us um, at least as long as he's been at N Dimension. So without further ado, um, I'll introduce Andrew. Um, as usual, um, we have a local audience, but we have, uh, we have quite a few offline sites as well. If you're offline and you'd like to ask a question, just uh, type that question in the chat box and, um, and push some button to raise your hand or something like that, and we will read your question for you. Andrew will take some local questions during the talk, but we'll make sure to leave 10 or 15 minutes at the end so we can get all the questions covered. So, Andrew, welcome. We're really glad to have you here. Thanks, Bill. It's, it's, it's good to be back again. I guess I've given a few talks here over the years. Um, in my uh, previous life, I, I did industry-style research, so I, I'm pretty familiar with the sorts of things you guys do, but for the past number of years, uh, that has really not been my goal. Um, so this is not a research talk. This is a uh, real um, industry experience selling products, de deploying real cybersecurity talk. If you're looking for new, exciting research directions, you probably won't find them here today but you might find interesting challenges uh, that you'll need to deal with if you, if you pursue new and interesting directions. Um, so this is about some work that I did, or our, our company did, but I personally was very involved with the deployment of a number of our uh, systems at a GNT co-op. So just to give you a background on a GNT co-op, uh, and by the way, this all has to remain anonymous as to the customer, so I'm, I'm trying not to say their name or any clues around that through the discussion today. GNT is generation and transmission. In actual fact, this co-op consists of a number of members who are distribution co-ops. So the uh, GNT has a primary control center. It has a backup control center. Um, it has several dozens of member co-ops. So the member co-ops are the distribution companies that supply power to their consumers and, and, uh, and generally rural um, sorts of consumers and, and farming being a big uh, factor. They run SCADA. Sometimes they have dual SCADA hosts. Sometimes they don't. Some don't even have SCADA. Um, some, most of them have some form of AMI. It's not necessarily the most advanced AMI at all those customers. Uh, the GNT owns several gas power plants, servant plants, so the largest one being around a 600 megawatt output, which is getting some fairly substantial. Uh, several wind farms. They're hooked into a transmission provider, uh, and I believe that has, and again, I don't understand the power side of this GNT fully. But I believe the transmission provider is hooked into them in order that they can buy transmission rights 
or, or, or provide the transmission provider with the information required to, to buy transmission rights for their generation and their load. Uh, they're hooked into a power provider that is the, that is the bulk power market. Uh, there, there is a market purchase entity, so there's a third party that actually makes their market purchase decisions for them. They have a hosted AMI service uh, 2,000 megawatts of combined load, so as I said, a, a fair bit of it being agricultural. None of their stuff is uh, under NERC-SIP, so that's an important issue. We, we do work with NERC-SIP regulated entities sometimes, but our company works mainly with small to mid market co-ops like this one, um, so most of our work is more security focused than compliance focused. And the primary function of this GNT is to do energy trading in order to minimize costs to their distribution customers. So they're looking at the spot market prices and the trying to forecast weather, I guess, and, and ramp up and ramp down plants and buy and sell off the market as needed to make the dollars come out right. So again, the, uh, we're providing a security solution, uh, as I'll describe. And it's protecting primarily SCADA, AMI, and PI data. So the SCADA being load data collected from members, the AMI being all the meter data coming off of, of customers, and the PI data being power plant data that um, includes, I think, not just the generation and load data, but you know, many, many various kinds of information from those power plants. Going into this project, this is, the, this is a picture of all of those systems that I described to you in the beginning and how they're interconnected. So I've got a, a primary control center over here on the left side. I've got a backup control center over here on the right side. And there's a certain amount of redundancy in this control center, multiple SCADA hosts and multiple networks. Uh, there are a number of power plants, uh, each of which has their own fairly complex structure. Uh, there's a whole bunch of members, so the distribution co-ops, uh, and then the other various entities I mentioned are here. All of these are interconnected, or, or were, were and still are, interconnected through a private uh, WAN, uh, at least from a telco, at speeds from one megabit ranging all the way down to 64 kilobits. So this is all IP traffic, but some of it is pretty slow. Um, the primary issue that the GNT was concerned with is they don't really know anything much about the internal network structure of their members. So if a SCADA host at a member is compromised, that host is, is directly adjacent, more or less, without any security devices intervening to everything else connected to that inter interconnect. So a compromised um, member system could ultimately lead to a compromise of any or everything connected to this internet, interconnect. So the, the goals um, in our security deployment were to protect these OT systems, protect the GNT from attack through the members, plants, third parties, from any, any kind of uh, attack on anywhere on that interconnect. Protect the, uh, the plants and, and members from attack by other members and protect from a, a WAN compromise. So yes, this is a private network. This doesn't mean it's a secure network. It means it, it, it's in fact an MPLS network, which means there's labels stuck onto the front of every packet saying this belongs to the GNT, this belongs to Best Buy, <laughs> uh, whoever the other customers are sharing the infrastructure. And the, in, a, in such a network, every single router on the network has to be secure and properly configured and uh, otherwise, you don't get security. So to, to rely on a private network to supply security is, is a, mis, a, mis, a misstep. Um, in addition to protecting the OT systems, we also monitor for intrusions. So we're watching the GNT's OT systems, the plants, and the members, all for any kind of cybersecurity intrusion on those networks. All of this is aimed at reliability. Uh, we want to improve resilience against cyber threats, obviously. But we also wanted to um, improve the reliability of communications. And uh, you'll see how as, as I go through what we did. 
so in short, we're ensuring availability, integrity, and confidentiality in, in that order as usual in the control system space. Availability by improving the reliability communications and uh, integrity and, and confidentiality for all the traffic on the interconnect. Uh, that is for load and plant data, and the bottom line is, is it's all about dollars. Question, Al. This is on. Uh, Al Valdez, University of Illinois. Uh, when you say enable market trading, trading does this GNT have connections to adjacent utilities, and if so, are they communicating like control room to control room connections? Uh, several answers to that question. Um, the power plants are connect interconnected to the transmission grid, and. So the power plants, when they generate power, are not just serving the, this GNT's distribution entities. They're serving the grid. Uh, on, the, on the control side, they receive signals from a balancing authority, actually two balancing authorities, I think, as well as from the uh, grid power provider. Um, but they do not believe they provide any control signals. So in other words, this interconnect is, is exchanging information about load and plant data. There's no actual control signals distributed over this interconnect. So the, there's two devices that, that you'll see featured here, which are the security devices we deployed into the network. Uh, symbolized by this oval N is our, our unified threat management systems. And, um, they're not too different from other unified threat management systems on the market. Uh, they provide a variety of security functions, perimeter security functions and interior security functions. Uh, we use them to um, both do passive, as in intrusion detection, as well as active security functions, as in gateway and VPN. Um, we, d we build controlled DMZs to segregate various networks and provide certain encryption over various kinds of links. Um, and as I said, I, th I think the count is somewhere around 30 uh, UTMs are deployed in the solution. Uh, we also use a, in the solution, use a single uh, log management device um, symbolized by the data database looking symbol, which collects log and event information from all of the IDSs across the network and is, is used for their access to that information. So the, uh, there are sort of three key parts to our implementation. One is to secure the interconnect, so secure the communications across the interconnect and, all of, and, and restrict what protocols can flow across the interconnect. Uh, second is to segregate networks at both the power plants and control centers, segregate via controlled DMZs the corporate from the OT systems, the operations technology systems like SCADA. And the third piece is to monitor via IDS for in potential intrusions and log uh, information for forensic analysis if uh, an intrusion has occurred. Now in this diagram, I'm showing kind of the picture of all of the deployment of our security solution. So here you see all the N ovals around uh, the network that we deploy. They are deployed at the edges of the interconnect, essentially, for the control center, for the backup control center, for all the plants, uh, for all of the members. So there's, that's where there's a whole bunch of them, um, and at a few other places throughout the network. You'll notice I've got a, a whole bunch of, of arrows, of differently colored arrows. These are VPNs. Uh, let's see, the uh, green being internet-based VPNs, and the pink being um, the VPNs that are built over the, uh, the, the existing WAN. So in other words, we built point-to-point -point encrypted links across the WAN to protect against uh, um, uh, uh, attacks against the private WAN. We also, because all of these sites uh, all had internet connect connectivity, separate internet connectivity from their private carrier-based WAN, we, we put um, links across the internet. So yes, we're moving SCADA data potentially across the internet, uh, and we run OSPF across this whole cloud, uh, OSPF being a dynamic routing protocol, which is set up to bias towards the, the um, 
the private WAN links. So by default, it will communicate across the private WAN, but when an, a link goes down, it will communicate across the internet instead, encrypted in either case. Uh, our experience over time there uh, with this carrier-provided MPLS network was approximately once a month from, say, 30 sites, they would have some kind of an MPLS router outage, whether it was a hardware failure or the carrier messed up a configuration in a router. At one point, the, the carrier lost a router. It couldn't find it. I mean, lost in the logical sense. We knew where it was, but the carrier could not get into it or configure it or do anything to it for quite some time. Um, so we ended up, uh, again, one of the goals being improve reliab um, availability of communications. We end up in drastically improving their communications reliability because all of those router outages are taken care of now by backup communications over the internet. Uh, in addition, at these, at these points, we're also doing firewalling. So this, this um, big interconnect network is no longer carrying any arbitrary metasploit traffic you care to fire at it from a compromised host. It only carries about five ports worth of specific traffic, SCADA, AMI, um, some RDP traffic for remote management, and one or two other things, I forget. And no other ports are open across that network. Uh, in addition, um, let's see. I think I actually have a slide on the in addition. So that, that was the first key point, yes. Um, so we, we just summarizing those key points again. Uh, we built site-to-site -site VPNs using um, open VPN-based SSL VPNs. They, they for us at least, are easier to manage and more reliable than IPsec VPNs. And a few of those links, by the way, are radio-based VPNs, um, uh, radio-based links. So we're encrypting across, we don't really care, MPLS or, or internet or radio. Uh, some of the uh, third parties are, uh, we, we've built links to their IPsec, because again, the third parties are, are gonna be IPsec at their end, so that's an uh, interoperability concern. Uh, we're doing firewalling, we're doing dynamic routing. Oh, and I didn't, I didn't um, mention that at the primary and backup control centers, we have pairs of our systems that, that act in, an, and actually at the power plants, that act in an active standby failover way so that if, one, if we do have some kind of a hardware failure on one system, that the standby will pick up all functions of the active. Um, we also implemented segregation between corporate networks at both the primary control center and the backup consent control center by building control DMZs. So jump hosts between um, the OT systems and the corporate systems. And uh, that has uh, we, certainly caused a bit of angst on their part in that no longer could they just look at SCADA quite as easily on their corporate desktops. Now. Uh, they actually ended up deploying also a, a virtualization framework on their desktops and still, still using the desktops but using a VM to connect to the jump server to look at SCADA, which is a, a, you know, several steps, but it, meant, um, it, it means that any time a desktop, a corporate desktop is compromised, there's going to be several more steps for an adversary to take to get into the actual SCADA or, or operations networks. Uh, and that was done, as I said again, at, at, at the various plants and at the primary and backup control centers. So again, I'm recapping here the points I just made um, with the firewalls limiting inbound and outbound traffic to that controlled DMZ so that uh, traffic cannot go all the way in or all the way out. It has to make a stop at a jump server in the controlled DMZ. Um, we, we use for all administrative access to the security systems, we use two-factor authentication. We also use that for uh, VPN access. So from the virtual machine running on an employee's desktop, they must make a VPN connection to the jump server, and that VPN connection is authenticated by username, password, and, and uh, ephemeral two-factor key. Uh, we're running IDS, let me come back to that. At all of these points, we're running IDS on, on all of these unified threat management systems, so we've got a whole bunch of places where we get eyes watching the network now for potential intrusions. 
the DMZ servers have uh, third-party uh, antivirus solutions so that they're uh, strong and in some cases using whitelisting to protect those DMZ servers against attack. And overall, there's an Active Directory server providing centralized AAA ac uh, control of remote access. Now, um, I guess just, to, this just point. a clarification question, yes. Andrew. Is any of this uh, network fall under NERC-SIP regula no. regulations? No, because it's all local. Correct. None of none of well, beyond the very limited NERC-SIP sense in which every entity has to anal analyze their network to see if they have any critical assets. This is uh, this GNT, even the generation plants, none of them uh, are considered critical assets mm -hmm. under NERC-SIP. Okay, and since I'm asking questions, uh, this is Bill Sanders, just one more question. Um, so, as I understand it, you've got one network that's by default the one you use and it's more private because of the way you've built it, and one that's more public but is still encrypted. Do you have any, um, just, I mean, what is the justification that one is more secure than the other? Uh, given, given that they're both encrypted? Um, I'm, I'm not saying that one is more secure than the other. They, they're both encrypted using the same technology. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that one is more or less trustworthy. We prefer the MPLS network because it is a private network, so it has a certain expectation of availability that is perhaps higher than the internet connections even though it's a generally quite a bit lower bandwidth than the interconnect, internet connections. Uh, there was also some concern at some of the members about impact on their, on their corporate internet traffic since it's sharing that same connection in many cases. Um, here I'm just showing uh, the eyeballs are not devices. They're just emphasizing that we're doing intrusion detection at uh, many points throughout this whole network. So watching lots of different s sources of traffic throughout the network. We, and to mention the, the company, we do not actually see any of the data that comes off those IDS sensors. We've worked with the customer to tune them, but the customer manages the IDS alerts and and uh, responds to them as needed. Occasionally calls us. What kind of IDS? Uh, we are running uh, snort-based IDS, augmented with some SCADA rules, and um, but a fairly standard IDS. Uh, we oh we also at the in the in that monitoring we also do some scheduled port scanning to watch for uh, changes in open closed ports on servers. Uh, we do some vulnerability scanning, but that is a manually initiated process. And it, to what degree the utility, the GNT does that, I, I, I couldn't say, um, in monitoring utilization of some of the servers. Uh, finally, there's a uh, centralized log and event server uh, down here in the corner, only one of them throughout the whole network that is pulling in all the IDS uh, and, and port scanning and so on, traffic and all of the logs from across the whole network so that they've got it all in one place. It, it is then forwarding events out to email lists so it ends up on employees' iPhones. So they are getting um, fairly immediate alerts if, if there are things that the IDSs are triggering. And the IDSs that are on the, uh, on the OT systems, at least, are monitoring really very uh, restricted set of protocols and a very restricted type of traffic. So those, uh, so far as, again, we don't have access, direct access to the traffic, but um, since we haven't had too many complaints about these things generating a lot of stuff, uh, those should be generating fairly, uh, should be fairly quiet on, on an ongoing basis and generating relatively few alerts, false positives. Yes, I think I just said all of that stuff. Oh, one more thing is um, we do actually have a way to display sort of a summary security status for the, uh, the various uh, IDS sensors on the SCADA screen. And that's, that's tied in with the particular vendor of, of, uh, of SCADA that we work with. 
So um, that's, that's a description of what we've implemented as a security solution. Let me pause here and see if we got any questions. Maybe there are even questions where I could take at this point from uh, online. So uh, the question is, even though this entity is not required to comply with the SIPs, are, is it in fact required, do we in fact implement um, SIP three through nine? I guess it'd be a way to look at it. Some aspects of that, absolutely. Um, in some ways we go above and beyond that. Uh, the NERC SIPs do not currently require any encryption of SCADA or whatever traffic between a control center and a substation or between, between any two points. Um, so we go well ab above and beyond that. Um, we do the intrusion, detec uh, intrusion detection I don't think is mandated by SIP yet. I think it's gonna be under SIP version five. But I'm not 100% certain of that right now. Um, uh, the firewalling aspects, and we did not particularly draw out uh, electronic security perimeters as they're called by the SIPs, but I believe you, you would find our, our, the firewalling that we've done uh, at all of those sites to, to fall under uh, SIP, version, SIP 005. I think that would satisfy that requirement. So we haven't analyzed it specifically to answer that question, but I, it, it would go at least a, a good part of the way towards that, yes. Any others from online? Okay. So I'll, I'll now divert into some of the experiences I, that I had through this uh, whole project. As I said, I was the person who uh, went on site at many of the customer sites and, and helped get it all installed. Um, it's been fully deployed for more than a year. Full deployment took probably a year and a half to, to two years. So why so long? <laughs> uh, it, it has detected several um, sort of questionable cyber events, but I, I, none that, is, as far as we know, have been directly attributed as attacks. Now, that's not too surprising because, A, in this industry, we don't hear a whole lot about real attacks anyway. Um, the corporate networks here are not monitored. Those would be the first point of attack. Uh, so there may, in fact, I, I know that there have been a number of, of uh, compromised desktops on their corporate network over this period. Uh, the firewalls, we're not locking rejected packets from firewalls. I see no point in doing that. If you block the attack, what do you care? Um, so the firewalls may well have blocked attacks that we don't know about. And um, the, the last point, obviously, uh, we don't get the data. The GNT may have had attacks and resolved them and not told us about it. Uh, we have uh, affected a significant improvement in the communications availability, as I mentioned, because now it doesn't matter if the MPLS goes out, it switches over to the internet and they have time to get the MPLS network fixed. Can you, can you give any numbers about communication availability? Uh, yes, I mean, over, over the course of that year, we, I saw five MPLS router outages, uh, which were happening, you know, some happened while our system was deployed and some happened before it was deployed. So there would have been five outages of communications. Had our system been fully deployed that entire time, we would have saved five outages. O over about a year and a half, say. No, no, how long was each outage? Oh, it, it varied. Um, I mean, sometimes it would be a day until a new router gets brought in. Sometimes it would be an hour till it's rebooted. Sometimes the, in the case where the carrier lost the router, it was weeks. Um, so let's see. Um, I, IP is, is the interoperability fabric in this solution. This is, this is one real experience I got out of this. We found almost no serial stuff. It's, it's, this, this entity is, is almost everything is and already was IP. Uh, so that's the OT protocols, the ICCP communications between um, power plants, uh, the DMP3 protocols, over SCADA, Modbus here and there. Um, some of the proprietary communications, the SCADA systems use a certain amount of proprietary communication. Uh, and then there's a bunch of IT protocols that are still traveling this, this interconnect for things like remote administration. Sadly, there's still FTP in there, I think. Ordinary, not secure FTP. Um, 
there's a bunch of custom built devices and so on that talk on these protocols. Uh, so it, it, you know, it, it's nice to try to think about control networks as being pure and consisting only of the control traffic, but they consist of a whole bunch of other junk too. And it's really hard to get rid of all that stuff. Uh, before I move on, I think we have a question from the... Uh, what is the org structure for the CyberSOC, uh, the folks watching and responding to the events? Is it 24-7? Is it insourced? Is it outsourced? That's the question. Okay, I, I think I understand the question. It's asking about um, response to events. The uh, one other interesting learning here is th this being a uh, GNT, a widely distributed GNT, uh, is very under resourced on the IT side, and it's very much the IT folks that I was working with to deploy this, and the IT folks that still run and manage this and respond to the events, and. <laughs> um, when, when, the, uh, when, when a board member of the GNT walks into the IT guy's office and says, my computer's broken, can you fix it? That gets priority <laughs> over the security solution that we're in the midst of deploying. Um, so I, th I think the answer is they get to it as when they can, but it's, 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 very, uh, it's very constrained. And so this is, is making us look very much at a a uh, more of a subscription managed cloud-based service for assisting utilities and getting at this. Uh, it's, it's just a, sort of the nature of these widely distributed um, and, and more rural utilities that they're not gonna have a lot of uh, IT folks on staff. They're not gonna have the top dollar security guys on staff because the banks are gonna pay more and they're gonna move to bigger cities. Um, so that they need, they need help in that regard. Yeah, I was just wondering about the firewalls. Did you take a look at the firewall logs to see whether, you know, potentially there might be something that, that did block out? You said that, you know, that could have been a possibility, but if you looked at the logs, you would know if that was happening. Yeah, we, we don't currently have the logging turned on on, okay. on rejected traffic on the firewall rules. Again, that would be something worth doing. I think if we were trying to support this as a service, we would want to look at that. Uh, but but the customer is, is, is already... Uh, overwhelmed, I guess, with many other things to do, so it's not looking at those. So another interesting experience was um, politics kind of got in the way. So this was securing the GNT and its systems in interconnect. We really wanted to get to working with the members and get into the members' networks, and, and I drew the member as a single bubble, but it's a big complex network. It's a distribution utility. We wanted to get into the members' networks, figure out how SCADA is deployed there. All we know is there's one server there that's connected to the, the uh, unified threat management system at that member. We don't know anything about how that network is built. It might be that that SCADA server is just dropped onto their corporate network. It very likely is in a good number of those members. Um, we're working for the GNT, not the members. The GNT, the, the members of the GNT actually own the GNT. That's, that's the ownership structure. Yet, um, the members don't want the GNT to know anything about their network. They don't even want them to know IP address spaces. They, they are very protective of their domain. They don't even want the GNT running IDS and watching their traffic. Well, we kind of we, we kind of won that battle, or, or or maybe we're just doing it. I don't know, <laughs> but it is happening on that SCADA side. Uh, and then a third problem was the GNT doesn't want to own a system that is in the path of critical member traffic, so that if that system goes out and the members got con control problems, the member isn't calling the GNT saying, "Hey, you have to help me now." Um, so that was not something I really hadn't anticipated. I thought, oh, this is great. You know, we'll, we'll deploy this whole initial solution, then we'll roll out and really secure all the member systems as well. But we've had quite a bit of resistance to doing that. Um, in fact, uh, you recall I, I mentioned um, deploying internet links. So at, at those member systems, we've got, in some of them, an internet connection so that we can provide backup links Sadly, we weren't able to get internet connections at all of them because some of them looked at that and said, okay, that's a connection into our network and that affects our PCI compliance. 
because PCI compliance requires enumerating all of the firewalls and doing something about them. I'm, I'm not an expert on PCI compliance. Probably my, my guess is that in those members that refuse, this data is actually sitting on the corporate network along with the billing. So yeah, there's only one big network and only PCI compliance covers the whole thing. So some, several members on account of PCI compliance refuse to have better availability for their SCADA traffic. Um, <clears throat> geography. Many of these sites were fairly remote. In fact, spanning distance, I guess, across this would be several hundred miles. So going from one site to another site is, is, takes a long time by car. Uh, fortunately, I fly private aircraft that helped me a whole bunch. I was able to get to sites much faster than any of their employees. Um, I don't know if you can see it in this picture, it's a little too fuzzy, but there are several hundred more of these little windmills out here at this fairly remote site. Um, and by the way, you, you see the little tiny black box at the base of the windmill. That's actually a full-size shed that you can stand up in. These are 300-foot high towers. Um, they offered to let me go up inside one. They have a thing called a climb assist, which is a harness that you put on, and then you can climb the ladder, and it's pulling you up, and I guess pulling you when you come back down. I never got around to that. And wish I had, uh, but those are some really huge Siemens turbines. Uh, so, so sadly, um, it means you have a lot of scheduling and a lot of time used up in getting to and from various places. Uh, weather can be a major disruption. Um, this is a uh, gas storage facility. You buy natural gas from a pipeline and you pump it into the ground specifically into a uh, salt dome, which is probably where it was pumped out of once a while ago. And this is market trading. This is betting that eventually the price of natural gas is going to rise and you're going to pump it back out and sell it later. Anyway, it's a site that's on their network connected into SCADA. Um, drove in there uh, one day to do some work, and you know, 20 minutes after we arrive at the site, all the guys who work there are jumping into their pickups and, and heading out. It's because there's a big thunderstorm approaching, and like, what's the big deal? It's just, it's just going to rain, right? Well, no, you drove across a dry creek on the way in. And once that thunderstorm starts, it's going to fill the creek up, uh, creek up with six feet of water, and you're not leaving for 12 hours. Hope you brought a sleeping bag. So come back the next day. Try again. Uh, a similar thing happened to us um, at one of the wind ranches. Uh, we're actually all set up trying to configure a device, and uh, a thunderstorm comes through the wind ranch and actually took the power out of the substation, and so all of a sudden we're working in the dark. And that's, of course, the time we find out that the UPSs aren't properly configured either, and we lose all the, the devices, everything goes down, and, and when, when the power comes on later, we have to restore everything. Um, so that's fun stuff. Uh, this is one of their big gas plants. You have to schedule outage windows maybe weeks in advance because it's not just with the plant where you're doing the work, but it's with several of the third parties like the power provider uh, and the balancing authority. They have to know that for these two, four hour window, communications are gonna be out. And you better get it back on at the end of that four minute window. So you go there planning to do your work and then you have some last minute events that show up like this one where we got to the plant, we scheduled this weeks before. They had the thought, they didn't think to warn us that the day before we went there, um, somebody had been pressure washing the, the top of a transformer shed and the water leaked through and the transformer had got wet and blown up. Blew steel doors off this building. So they were in the midst of a big emergency response can figure out why this all happened and it's like no, no no you can't touch anything just go away uh, this is again one of these plants that takes a full day to get there and a full day to get back so you go away come back a couple weeks later um, another one we were working on equipment just about to start making critical changes and uh, there's a big bang and uh, the a pressure relief valve blew off well the when the pressure relief valve it's a one single use pressure relief valve from a two megawatt generator, it shoots a thing about the size of a manhole cover 400 feet into the air. Um, so it's like all of a sudden, that's it. <laughs> no more work there, come back again a couple weeks later. Um, 
change windows need to be coordinated with with uh, third parties, as I said. Uh, they have interesting ideas about access control for third parties. This box is at one of the plants. There's, there's a mirror here because there's a, a, a firewall behind the box. And the mirror is so you can see the link lights in the firewall. And there's a key switch here, and the key switch is the access control. It, it opens or closes the wire connected to the firewall. I'm not sure the firewall is relevant. That's uh, whether or not the third party has access. Uh, there's significant periods of, you just, you can't touch this right now. It really doesn't matter if heart bleed is, is happening right now. You just can't touch this. It's spring, it's irrigation season, crops are growing, we can't afford the power to go out. Or it's summer, the air conditioning is on, we can't afford the power to be out. Or, it's August, especially. So this particular GNT works under some, I think it's called coincident peak pricing. The price they pay for power throughout the year depends on the amount of power they use off the grid on the highest consumption day, which is gonna be in August, but you don't know when it is until later in September. So you're getting into the middle of August and you don't touch anything because this might be the peak day and we just don't know yet. Um, so that's a challenge that I think they're still trying to work through. And maybe it explains this, this jumble of stuff, uh, none of which is doing anything, but everything's powered. I just, I've noticed this in power plants. When people take stuff out, they, they may disconnect the communication links, but then they leave the box there running because I guess power's free. <laughs> so sorting stuff out is sometimes a challenge. That's, that's another problem. Um, you, you go into a plant and there's a huge amount of complexity. There are some diagrams for sure, but there's nothing complete and there's no way you're gonna figure everything out. Uh, sometimes you're just working in the dark and, and you have to start working under that mode, whether you like it or not. <laughs> you absolutely have to have backup plans for your backup plans. You have to know halfway through your outage window, if it's not going right, we have to be backing out to try again later. And sometimes your backup plan doesn't work right and uh, you start scrambling at that point. Um, there was, only one time where I made a rule change on a firewall that propagated throughout the OSPF network and took the entire interconnect down. And it's a really sick feeling when you realize you've done that, you're sitting there wondering, what am I gonna do next? And suddenly somebody pokes their head and says, hey, do you know SCADA's out? Yeah, I know that. Uh, Safety briefings, you will go through lots of safety briefings if you ever do these on site. Um, they're videos, they're books, they're whatever. Well, let me summarize them all for you right there. If everybody else is running, you better catch up. And that's what I have to tell you. It's, it's in this particular GNT, it's really all about the money. It's, it's about optimizing everything so that the systems will stay up, which is in the, in the face of failure, in the face of cyber attacks, uh, so that the GNT can get the best price and get the best price for its customers and make the most money. And uh, I think we have to remember that, that ultimately that's what all this stuff is about. Question from online. Uh, yes, what aspect of this project surprised you most? Um, the number of hurdles, I would say, the number of hurdles that delay its implementation, I was estimating three months to do the year and a half installation uh, before I got into it. Um, it's just astonishing how many things came my way that would cause us to back out, go away. Oh, and then there's a cooling off period, by the way, when something's been broken and not gone right, it's like they don't wanna see you again for a couple weeks. So it's, it's all about the money. It's all about the money, it's all about the money. Yeah. And all, this, all these little boxes with the little script ends on them cost money. They do. And uh, so 
It's really sort of a two-part question. You can ask, answer either part or both, depending on how you feel about it. But um, it's really a question, on one hand, about how do you convince the customer that it's worth the money they have to pay you? Um, and um, the second question is, and maybe it's a more technical question, is how did you decide the architecture that you propose for this? And, um, and, and how do you argue that spending the money makes it more secure? How, so to give a, a general answer as to how do we argue okay. how, do, how, how do we spending the money is more secure, I can't do that. Um, even though we do, this is our business, I, I can't give you an answer as to why sometimes customers decide that spending the money is worthwhile. In this particular case, I, I can say for sure that as we had our initial meetings with the customer, a very key issue that became clear was that improving availability of their communications would help. And we, in fact, didn't have a dynamic routing capability and put it into our products specifically for this customer. So I think that was It, so, so Bill's, Bill's saying this is more about availability than security. Um, that being a com availability being a component of can we see the skated data and can we do our market trading? So yes, I'm, I'm not, not sure I would agree. That's not necessarily a part of security. It, I think it is. Um, again, I, I don't, I don't, we don't know, and maybe the GNT doesn't know whether we've blocked real attacks, but maybe we have. Another uh, online question? Uh, was your solution driven by best practices, standards, or results of vulnerability assessment? Um, so was this, yes, I would say. Uh, we uh, performed some initial vulnerability assessments ourselves to understand the networks. Uh, best practices are, are very much implemented in the DMZ segregation, so that's ISA 99. Um, uh, NIST SP83, and I think that's also talked about in, uh, in some of the other NIST documents. So yes, I would say very much guided by best practices. As I remarked earlier, we did not, we were not attempting to implement the SIPs, but you know, some, some cert certainly some guidance from the SIPs as well, of knowing about ports and services and uh, protecting against open ports and services. Uh, I got a question, some question from the IDS. Uh, uh, my question is that whether, uh, do you see that there is a necessary to perform the deep packet analysis on the, uh, on, on the interconnect network, such as using some of the SCADA specific um, uh, information or knowledge in order to detect the attacks or the corruptions? Um, so the, the IDS, we're running SNORT is augmented with digital bonds SCADA signatures, so it depends if you consider those deep packet analysis. They are looking at for specifically for uh, signatures of some SCADA traffic. Yes, that would, that would improve your um, detection of real attacks much better. Uh, that would be desirable. Uh, in this particular network, though, we have no control traffic, so maybe not quite so important in this network. There's, there's no way as well, I, I guess I shouldn't take. I should. I should take that back. I was going to say there's no way to do control, uh, but that may not be true because we don't know enough about the SCADA systems at the members. And perhaps you can drive a control action to that SCADA system um, and do control from there. Tim. Uh, Tim Yardley, University of Illinois. So a, a bit of a follow-up and, and tangent to, to Bill's question is obviously justifying the project to get it deployed is, is one, but what types of metrics did you see requested from them to determine whether or not um, you know, this was effective in, in, in how they, they went it? Since it was driven by availability, maybe it's just uptime, but um, have you seen other requests in terms of, you know, um, intrusions prevented, things detected, you know, those types of things? We, we haven't. In, in fact, we had planned to do a post-installation assessment, have it done by a third party, 
and that hasn't even happened. I, I think they are simply, once again, too busy. Okay, the, the security solution's in place, we're moving on. Hi, Andrew. This is Xing Shu from ADSC in Singapore. So I have a general question. Uh, what makes it so difficult to completely and physically segregate the enterprise network from the control network? Instead, I think, I guess, maybe many companies are still using firewalls to logically separate the two. Okay, I, I guess I'm not sure what you mean by physically. The, the enterprise network is a physically distinct network. They need, um, they need access between the two networks. And largely that's used for their day-to-day -day operations. The people who sit in their offices have desktop machines and they, they, want, and they need to access CSCADA on a, on a constant basis. Um, so yes, you could deploy, I, I guess, a bunch of physically redundant computers and screens and desktops. Um, people have done that at some companies. Uh, here they decided to, they, they didn't want to you know, have a separate computer in everybody's office in order to get access to SCADA. Uh, in, in other cases, and um, yes, in fact, in this, in this case, there, uh, there's AMI traffic. So some of the meter data is coming from members across this interconnect and going to hosted AMI services. So in that case, that interconnect is in fact carrying AMI traffic out through the internet to whoever is the, uh, the hosting company. So you need to have a path in that case. And actually, as I look at this now, I'm not really sure what that path is. I see, thank you. Yep. Uh, is it reasonable to assume that many non-security benefits were realized, i.e. updating asset info, network topology, design documentation, overall system operations efficiencies by limiting unused ports, et cetera? Yeah. Yes, I would say it is quite reasonable. Um, we, the assessments we did in the beginning largely consisted of mapping the network and figuring out what talked to what. Um, there, I mentioned an FTP server. There's a particular FTP server that is used to exchange traffic with some third parties. That was very hard to figure out. No one seemed to know how it worked. It was a just don't touch it, it it's working situation. And uh, now they understand it a little bit at least and I'm hoping maybe they've gotten rid of it by now, but I haven't been back there in a few months. And uh, another question, are any honeypots being deployed or considered for future improvements? Um, no, we, we haven't um, positioned those with the customer and we haven't installed any additional systems in um, probably six months to a year. Tim. Uh, so a follow-up on, on a statement you made earlier about the client wanted a redundancy solution because availability was, was a, a driver for them. Um, what other types of, of requests did you see that pushed you um, to, to innovate in your product beyond what you had today to, to realize this deployment or any other deployment um, that, uh, that was either not expected for it or that... Uh, um, that now, in retrospect, has been one of your you know new assets per se or features that that you hinge on. Um, as I, so so the the dynamic routing was done specifically ahead of time. As we worked through this, um, it, it became clear that we'd really like to have a port bonding facility. We never actually did that. Um, I, I'm not going to say that it really drove any, it, it drove us to ad, adapt and improve a lot of the capabilities we had, um, but I, we didn't any, end up really building anything else specific. The thing I would really like to have built for this customer and any customer would be a much better management system that would give a comprehensive view of all of the devices and all of their configuration and all of the activity. Um, sadly, network management remains one of those problems that is not well solved. Yeah, so that was actually a related question I was going to ask, which is um, you have a whole bunch of these deployed. I think you said 30 at, at this location. Um, is there centralized management, or how, how has the, I guess, ongoing process been for them in terms of now managing the solution now that you've deployed it? There, there is not centralized management. There's centralized event and log collection, but not centralized management, so they have to go to each device in order to configure it. 
On the other hand, configuration does not change very frequently at all. Uh, so they, they retain backups of the configuration files, um, but I don't think they make changes on the devices very often now that we've, we've got it pretty much stable. Question from online. Uh, with CIP5 coming about, this GNT will have medium impact assets as all control centers and backup control centers are medium impact. Was this taken into account in the design? Uh, the design was done before CIP was even a, a five, version five was even a draft, so uh, the, the easy answer is no. Um, but then the more complex answer is since there is no control from these control centers, um, not sure whether that's going to be true that they will fall under CIP version 5 scope. Or in the sense of you have to do something substantial to address them. Okay, that was fantastic, Andrew, and you got a really good group of questions, both uh, remote and here in the room. So thanks very much, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back here uh, on the return from your work uh, at the TCIPG uh, workshop next week.